So we are moving into the last and final session as we continue breaking down on the road to democracy. <laughs> so just before lunch, we looked at participation and inclusion with a focus on youth. And now we are moving into democracy in the digital age, which can be a tool for participation, which can enhance participation. And as other speakers have mentioned that in as much as it can be a tool for good, it can also be used as a tool for authoritarianism. So the panel uh, this afternoon is just going to break it down for us to see how we can harness uh, some of the digital tools for the advancement of democracy. And there is no one more capable of leading us into this discussion than Professor Carlison, Alison G. Wald, who is an expert on digital governance in Africa. She is uh, the executive director of ICT Africa, and she also runs a, a doctoral program with the Mandela School on digital economy and society. She works with a number of regional bodies, including the African Union Commission, the, the SADC, and other regional economic uh, communities on issues to do with uh, digital policy and data governance. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Alison Gewald so that, uh, and the uh, Ebo team. Thank you very much. Um, I've actually just um, been juggling the World Economic Forum. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously, the time is a, a difficult time for us in the country. And um, a lot of the challenges that we're facing, a lot of the protests that have been organized around both the xenophobic attacks and the gender-based violence pr protests on parliament today, have really been made possible by, you know, social networking mobilization of, of, of people. Um, obviously, this is one of the positive sides of, of social networking. Um, we know, going back to the Arab Spring, how um, the connectivity of the North African states, way more connected than sub-Saharan Africa, actually enabled people to get messages out to the rest of the world and mobilize, of course, um, uh, in favor of democracy and against um, uh, highly authoritarian and repressive regimes um, in, the, in North Africa. Um, of course, what we immediately saw after that with the sort of hype and joy of our connectivity was that, um, particularly in Egypt, um, the high levels of internet penetration and sophisticated government surveillance enabled the use of social networks to um, clamp down um, and place many of the activists in prison, who, many of whom still sit in prison today. Almost half of the university have been arrested at one period of time or the other um, of uh, university, um, American University of Cairo. Um, and so we really face, with the recent elections that we've had and that you spoke about in earlier panels um, over the last um, little while, um, the challenges of trying to conduct free and fair elections in a digital environment that enables um, political organization and mobilization on the one hand, but of which there's increasing evidence of um, misinformation and um, at a geopolitical level, um, you know, uh, inter interference in democratic procedures and, and outcomes um, in countries. Obviously the highest profile um, uh, claims have been made around the US and Russian interference um, in the last uh, US elections. But from the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, evidence, we know that there's been interference in the Kenyan, last gen Kenyan general elections, and of course been in interference, political interference in South Africa, um, among several other countries, but just to note some of those countries that are here. Um, so, I want, to, I want to speak about uh, the role of uh, um, internet and um, digital uh, social networks in, in enabling democracy and some of the dangers they pose. But I wanted to start by speaking more generally about um, the access to the internet 
as a um, enabling uh, means for exercising other human rights. So very often it's claimed that internet is a, a human right, but in fact the um, UN um, resolution on this, by the, uh, which was led by the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights, was that access to the internet was critical in the modern age to enable people to exercise their rights. So really, in, a, if, in discussing the role of um, digital policy or digital practices in, in democracy, really needs to start with the equitable access to those means of communication in a modern economy, in a modern um, polity, in order to engage effectively. And on that score, I just wanted to um, highlight again, I've just been in a panel on the, the dreaded fourth industrial revolution, um, where we, you know, speaking about all sorts of claims around employment and various things, when in fact, um, across the continent, the um, average penetration rate in African countries is less than 15%. So less than 15% of people able to participate in this digital era, never mind the fourth industrial revolution and the benefits or, or not that come from that. Um, South Africa, of course, has much greater penetration um, than the rest of sub-Saharan Africa at 50%. So about half of our population are connected. But the other half who are not connected look no different from the 90% of Rwandans that are not connected. And by the way, despite all the forward-looking technological frameworks there, the highest gender gap of over 60% of the African countries we surveyed, so more in line with kind of Indian um, gender disparities, um, Asian gender disparities than we see on the African continent. So, um, I mean, this is really cri critical if we kind of, we're assuming in our discussions that um, people, citizens, are equitably able to engage in modern elections. And I'm not even talking about, you know, being able to hold um, actual electoral poll, you know, digital polls, but just actually to get information in order to participate as citizens in, in, in a democracy. Um, we're simply not seeing that even at a, a, you know, a level of um, economic participation. So that 15% is way below the... Um, understood critical mass of 20% that you need to have in economies to get those network effects, those positive economic effects. So, um, you know, if we think about democracy more in terms of, you know, um, the social compacts, government's responsibilities to citizens, um, it, you know, it extends far more fundamentally simply to, to access of communication, not only... Um, you know, whether we, people are doing certain things in elections. Obviously, if people do have their access to those social networks, um, it means that they are unequally able to compete in elections. Um, and so you are likely to have more um, privileged interests being able to use these media um, um, in elections, never mind just, you know, for ordinary, um, you know, well-being business, their prosperity, or whatever else it is. So, um, Lengi, I was wondering if you could perhaps start um, and uh, tell us a little bit about you and your organization so that people have a context from where you, you're speaking. And um, then I think you were, you were wanting to um, address some of the issues around um, uh, governance and enforcement of elections, but I know your work has been on um, privacy and surveillance, so those are obviously also very pertinent. Why don't you tell us something about your work? Okay, um, thank you, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tengi Wedube. I'm from the... Uh, is it fine now? Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tengi Wedube. I'm from the Center for Human Rights. Um, the Center for Human Rights is based at the University of Pretoria under the Faculty of Law. So the Center for Human Rights is um, uh, an academic institution that offers um, uh, academic pr uh, programs in human rights at postgraduate level, master's, um, uh, PhD, and postdoctoral. 
So um, we focus on different thematic areas, including democracy, transparency, digital rights. And at the same time, uh, the center is also an NGO. So we are also involved in, um, in uh, human rights activism. We do a lot of um, advocacy work focusing on children, on women, on business and human rights, like a whole lot of issues under, uh, the under human rights. Um, that's the, the center. And we also work in liaison with um, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and other institutions like um, the Pan-African Parliament, like my colleague indicated in the morning. So basically what I do uh, first of all, I'm a doctoral candidate at the Center for Human Rights, and my research focuses on surveillance. I also had um, one of the units at the Center whose focus is on democracy, transparency, and digital rights in general, but more specifically, um, we look at issues around freedom of expression, um, access to information, and uh, uh, digital rights in its different forms. So um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, issues around the use of the possibility of using uh, digital technologies in elections. And also uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the right to privacy and um, balancing the right to privacy and transparency in the context of, of elections. So I'll, I'll start with the issue around uh, privacy and, and transparency. I just want to say uh, some of you have this small booklets. I didn't have many of them, but they're just uh, scattered um, in, in on, the, on our desk. They some have them, some don't. So uh, basically, um, from I, I'm, I'm, I can't talk about the right to privacy without first talking about access to information, because the right to privacy is an exception when we are looking at access to information. So I'm going to speak about access to information briefly. So um, basically, access to information is provided if when we're looking at the normative framework under the African human rights system, access to information is provided for under the African Charter, uh, under Article 9 of the Charter, which provides for freedom of expression, but it has also been interpreted to include access to information. And the Commission has, African Commission on Human and People's Rights has gone on to elaborate on what Article 9 means. And in that uh, process of elaboration has come up with different instruments uh, that speak to African, to, to access to information. So one of the instruments that have been developed to, to expand on and explain on, on access to information is basically the model law on access to information, which is basically a model or an example to say, if a state party wants to develop an access to information law, this is how it's supposed to look like. This is the guide. These are the principles. These are the exceptions. So it, it, uh, it, it gives guidance to state parties. And then in the context of elections, the commission went on to develop this uh, uh, normative guide. It's, um, it's a standard setting document on access to information and elections. It basically explains what... Um, categories of information are important and the stakeholders that are supposed to uh, disclose information during the context of elections, which include electoral management bodies, the civic society, law enforcement agents, um, uh, 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 election observers. Uh, and they also both document, they define the principles uh, that define access to information, things like um, information management, record system mechanisms, um, and um, uh, placing emphasis on access to information laws. And one of the principles which has been defined by the African Commission as a cardinal principle when we are looking at access to information is proactive disclosure, which means uh, institutions, government institutions have to um, proactively and other relevant bodies, not only government and other relevant bodies, have to proactively disclose information pertaining to elections and other, other issues as well. Like Prof said, it's important for the realization of even other rights and economic, in the economic spectrum as well. So proactive disclosure means information has to be released even before citizens demand for information 
as in, for example, an electoral management body has to be in a position to disclose information timely, period periodically, and unconditionally. So uh, for, for, for that to be, to, to be possible, you need access to information, as, as Prof has alluded to, because the electoral management body can be in a position to proactively disclose information, like if you... If you look at the South African IEC, it has the, they are very active on, on social media and also the, um, their website as well, very active in that regard. But if you don't have access to internet, if you don't have internet, if data is very expensive, it means people will be, the information will be there, but people will not be able to access the information because of these hindrances. So in, in I, I was just highlighting that access to information is very important as a facilitative right to enable citizens to, to, to participate uh, from an informed, uh, an informed perspective, to, 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 to participate actively in, the, in, 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 the, in, in elections. Because it is also a right participating in elections which is provided for even under the African Charter. But for you to be able to meaningfully exercise the right to participate in democracy or other processes, you need access to information as an enabler. So it's a facilitative right, it's an enabling right. But at the same time, we are demanding transparency. We want our stakeholders and bodies to release information. Um, we want proactive disclosure, everything to be out there so that people are able to decide. But at the same time, there are issues that have become very important, especially in this context of the digital age, the right to privacy. If we are saying the electoral management body has to be transparent, which also includes releasing the voters' role, what are we saying about privacy? What are we saying about data protection? What are we saying about the security of the information that is in the voter's row? So that is something to consider. If you look at the, the issue of Zimbabwe, for example, for a very long time, the voter's role, there were issues around the voter's role. The voter's role was not in the public domain. People could not inspect the voter's role. There were, um, uh, people were saying there were names even of the deceased that were on the voters' roll and there were duplications. So there was really need for transparency and uh, to, 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 to inspect the voters' roll. So um, Zimbabwe then introduced the biometric system in, in, in the last elections. And then there was the issue of, you know, especially the opposition parties now saying, okay, it's now time to release the voters' roll. But now we have to remember that we have to balance between the need to be transparent, proactive disclosure, releasing information, and also at the same time protecting, because these days we know that data has become a very valuable commodity. There is data theft, out, there is identity theft and everything. It's a commodity. There are other people who are thriving on stealing your data. So as an electoral body, what, what happens when you have the voters' role, it has to be inspected. But people's information has to be protected. People's data has to be protected. So I just wanted to flag the need for, I'm, I'm glad we have a commissioner here for, for IEC South Africa. And it has been an issue what, that was raised at um, the International Conference of Information Commissioners to say, how do we balance the need to be transparent? as electoral bodies and also uh, the need to protect uh, uh, voters, voters' data. So uh, in, in that regard, you realize that there is need as well because most of the um, laws that we have, the electoral laws, have not taken into consideration issues around data protection. They've not taken into consideration issues around privacy. So there is need as well as we talk about transparency to also look at legislation that uh, that speaks about, uh, about, about uh, data protection. So when you look at Africa, what we have at the moment, we have, I think, about 23 countries only that have data protection laws. And even when you're looking at access to information, it's now to, uh, with Ghana, it's now 23 countries. So we are still lagging behind in Africa in that respect. Because both rights are very important. Access to information, they complement each other. Privacy and data protection, privacy, um, and access to information, they complement each other and they enable citizens to hold even public or the government to account. So in terms of our framework, in terms of our standards, as 
uh, African countries, we are lagging behind if we are looking at those laws. Like last week, this week on Monday and Tuesday, we were in Botswana. We were talking about access to information um, and elections. And we are in a country where they do not have an access to information law in the first place. We are not even talking about data protection and privacy. Access to information law, the, the, the bill has been pending. And they were even using the word dead, like the bill is dead, it died somewhere along the way. And th there was like no indication of, so when you're asking, so what's going to happen? Uh, is there any talk of reviving this bill? Like they, there is not even talk of reviving the, this bill. And you know, those are the challenges that we face. So I, I think I've spoken a lot around so that. You've raised so, so many interesting issues. So let's, let's come back to them because um, we've got a number of people who could pick up on, on a number of those points. But um, just to highlight the issue of biometric identities that you raise in the case of Zimbabwe, and of course, identity and citizenship being so intrinsic to one's participation in a democracy. Um, in, the in the context of sort of data protection and privacy, this has become a very, very big issue. Um, also around the protection of people's rights. So obviously, one, the state wants to exploit technologies in order to improve identification systems so that you can better deliver services, et cetera. On the other hand, it also creates opportunities for surveillance, control, um, repression of various kinds. Um, but interestingly, from the biometric point of view, um, the gathering, there's so few examples of um, full biometric systems in Africa. Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania is just beginning to introduce them. And Zimbabwe, of course, um, was very controversially, very inv um, recently involved with um, getting a free biometric system from the Chinese in exchange for the citizen data. Now, those of you who are involved with um, artificial intelligence and data analytics will know that one of the big challenges with these algorithmic biases is that there's not enough... Um, minority information fed into this. Minority or, in the case of Africa, I mean, this is in the American context, but in the context of, of, of Africa, you know, there's simply not enough people online feeding the machine learning and et cetera. And so you're getting these algorithmic biases, very simple ones like, you know, hand washing machines that are meant to be automatic, not being able to recognize black skin. Um, you've recently had a decision um, in uh, um, uh, California, that facial recognition may not be used other than in airports because the reading on, on, on African-American features is so often wrong. There's a big problem with gender distinctions on that. So um, there's simply not enough information getting into the system. And so the Chinese have provided the biometric system without any kind of you know, usual tied rights framework to it in order to get some African data to feed into their own systems, of course, for technologies that are then sold, sold back to, to, to Africa and African governments. So they're really big issues around you know, I identity, biometrics, privacy, and you know, the sale of a nation's um, identities to another nation without any say of those citizens and no protections, no safeguards um, um, on that. So these issues are becoming increasingly entwined and very, very difficult from a governance point of view um, to manage. But um, Commissioner Mohep, uh, I was wondering if you um, could just pick up on the issue of uh, the, the voters' role. I know um, uh, Commissioner Pansy Takula had yes. raised um, yes. the, ch the problems around the voters' role, obviously needing to be in the public domain, but the lack of privacy protections um, around it. And um, I just wondered if you could remind us of, yeah. of the implications of that. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. I, I must uh, preface my intervention in the following terms. That, you know, an election takes time to organize. And it cannot be that it will take so much time to organize and only right at the end somebody evaluates it on that last step. Every step of an electoral process is fundamentally critical. And so um, 
when, when you begin, for those that begin with a demarcation exercise as an election management body, uh, they go into, um, you know, um, cutting political borders and boundaries and electoral administrative boundaries, registering voters, um, you know, publishing that voters' role for everybody to object to, to correct their details, to remove the deceased, add on people that have come of age and so on. So every one of those processes becomes critical. When we then have candidates and they're objected to, um, and people engage with that process, it's also critical. But the same is true for elections, election day, the results uh, determination process and how those results are, are developed. It is useful to say up front, and I'll, I want to just peg this um, into the ground, that um, a good election is one that has law that is very precise, one that has um, steps along the way. Every critical milestone in an electoral process would have recourse. In other words, once voters have been registered um, and the voters' role has been developed, it's not a secret. Put it out there. Let it be objected to. Let us see who's on there, if that duplicates, and so on and so forth. Once the period of objection or petitions has concluded, move on to the next. So conclude every process of the elect uh, electoral process. The last thing that I, I want to say is that the outcome of an electoral activity, whether it's a registration process, it must be determined as quickly as possible, as transparently as possible. In an election, perception is a currency. It is, it's, perception is real. And that's what we trade um, in, 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 in an and so these are the things I'd like to refer back to when I deal with how the advent of the internet and social media um, has, has either enabled that process or not, or, or, or held back that process. The first of that is that a few years ago, in 2007, um, Kenya burned. People died. Uh, in 2008, it happened in Zimbabwe. In both instances, there are critical lessons we, we, we have learned. One was that, and in, in both of them, there was no social media or internet intervention. Not from the electoral management body side, not from, you know, um, from the wider citizenry. In, in Kenya, um, the, the elections were announced when, when some people believed that counting was still happening somewhere. I don't know, and I'm just putting this out there. And when, when one finds out, you understand that perhaps there's been a hand that for, was forced for that to happen. Fast forward to 2019, that's not possible. Because every citizen with a smartphone, uh, with a camera, with a little bit of data on it, is an observer. Um, it's a party agent. They have a place they send their results to, uh, you know, from the, the voting district or station where they are. And somebody can, in a very smart way, put that data together and they have the election results right there. At the same time, or even before, um, an electoral management body has it. Now, this is an enabling thing. It helps keep election management bodies honest. That's what they have to do. An election outcome should not depend on who counts that outcome. It should depend on how people have voted. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that Election management bodies that have been in the hand of the executive, I don't want to say in the pocket, I say in the hand of the executive, have historically said, you don't know. It is so difficult to manage this job. We need three months to, to declare the outcome of the 
of the election results. On a light note, I think it is done to hope that you will forget how people voted and then we can declare results. Now, the internet and social media will not let you do that. By the second day after voting, everybody knows what the outcome should be. And the pressure is on, on the electoral management body to do the right thing. And I think that's also very positive. A third positive is that people can understand how an election is won or lost. They have an appreciation of where support comes from and where opposition has arisen. They have smart tools in their hands to campaign with credible information at a very, very uh, minor um, cost, if not for completely for free. That we must also welcome because this is information or data that political parties need to mount credible elections. And the advent of social media and the internet have made that possible. The fourth point I wanted to make was that um, properly managed and, and used, these are tools that increase inclusivity, that make processing to happen at speed, that deal with um, the authenticity of the data. We no longer require for people to write things down and transmit them, and it depends on the handwriting of the person, how this thing is and should be. Um, it's hard to be a pilot. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so the accuracy, um, the reliability, and the quick, easy transmission of data can only stand election credibility and election management in good stead. You spoke about the voters' role. You know, the... In the last seven years, even, yes, I know countries that, that have had these processes for more than 10 years where you could interface with the voters' roll from, from your mobile phone. Um, now it's pervasive. Voters needed to come out at stations to, be, to you know, witness this thing, to check in person, and if you couldn't be there, you, you, know, you couldn't participate or your details would be incorrect. Right now, you sit in the privacy of your home. Um, wherever you are, you access this thing on, on your um, phone, on your iPad, whatever it is, and you check your details on the roll. It has reduced the amount of trees we have to cut to let people check the details on the roll. People do so at the time that suits them best, um, wherever they are, um, and, and that has made interface with the electoral process that more meaningful. The last issue that I wanted to raise on the issues that, that, that have become, become so easy uh, and easily managed is that um, the, the cost of, of running elections um, is coming down in real terms. That suits the issue that we have many competing needs as nations. Sometimes when elections are to be held, a health budget must be cut. Education budget must be cut to fund, to fund elections. When elections get onto platforms that people access themselves, there's a significant amount of cost saving that accrues. I want to give you an example. Um, a few years ago, um, a country I know had a huge um, contact center. You phoned um, that, that, that office toll free uh, and you spoke and checked things and spoke to somebody that needed to help you 
do this, that, and that. Because of that facility, though absolutely essential, was enormous. Fast forward, you provide facilities on the net for similar exercise. People access it where they are at no cost to you. You use that money to improve the service elsewhere. And that is thanks to the internet and social media. There are dangers though, and I want to, I want to talk about three very specific dangers. Disinformation and fake news. Very, very dangerous. In, in, another, in, a, in a country I know that I will not mention by name, we have a party that is entrenched in a certain province, has been for a long time, and has lost power there. People are traditional there. They get told, we have special votes on Monday, people will visit you at home. On Tuesday, you will go to the voting station as a special vote, but on Wednesday, everybody votes. On Monday, someone gets onto the uh, uh, social media and it spreads like wildfire. It says, on Monday, we vote um, for a party that, this party. Um, on Tuesday, we vote for this party. On Wednesday, we vote for the governing party. And on Thursday, a day after elections, by the way, all of us, vote for, for this party. And that is the party that had lost power, you know. The party comes back and say, how can these elections be free and fair in the circumstances? You're hard pressed to say that those elections will indeed be free and fair if that view holds pervasively. These are challenges because no one edits that. It goes out like wildfire. It's the absolute gospel truth as it gets out, and no one can stop it. And so the need to work with platforms has arisen beyond any means. And I'm glad in the last elections in that country I spoke about, um, the, the, the media platforms came to the party in a big way. The, the second major threat is that the Internet in the hands of the enemies of electoral democracy, it's a mighty weapon. Um, an election management body must, must monitor you know, social media and things. But when you have people that are professionally managing accounts, there's, there's, a, there's a handle called the man is not very rude. For those of you, Twitter handle. It's a powerful tool. It's pervasive. But it is professional. It's used by people who say, we can take your message, whether good or bad, we can, we can manage that message for you effectively. And they are, they are, they are terrorizing election management bodies at times. It, it is the social media. Thirdly, we, I know of a country that monitors where you know, a lot of the information they deal with on social media and on the internet comes from. Regrettably, it, it's very predictable. You will find um, the major centers that are developed, you know, pumping a lot of data or originating a lot of, of, of you know, the, the social media content, which means that in some, in some ways, the more developed areas get even further than the, le the least developed areas. There's a gap we will need to manage. Because an election, in true sense, must be a true equalizer. No one on election day must feel more elevated than the other. We must all be equal. The last thing that I wanted to point out is that there are threats. Even in, another, in the country I spoke about that I know, there are threats um, that when we like something, we, we, we all do it and it's not a problem. But when it threatens us, we even think of switching it off. I, I know countries on this continent on election day and a few days thereafter, 
no internet. It switched off completely. Um, so that the only source of information is, is this information, and there's no challenge to it. Um, in, in South Africa, I can't remember, it's three years or four years ago, there was an issue at the opening of parliament. Um, and, and those that manage the parliamentary precinct and connectivity switched it off. Boy, it was an issue. It was a huge issue. It will never be repeated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think you, the last point you've made is a very significant one. We'll come, we'll come back to it. Um, I think the, you know, the switching it off at the time of the election to avoid these kind of issues is, is something we'll come back to. But of course, that then negates all those positive aspects you were speaking about the nation of, as observers. Um, which have been very critical in identifying um, election fraud and, of course, um, violence um, associated with, with elections as well. So it's that dilemma, that paradox. Um, but I think, you know, what is also interesting is that, of course, you know, misinformation on the day can play a significant role. But if you look at the long-term data analytics that allowed Cambridge Analytica to swing the American vote, for example, you're talking about um, you know, that Facebook data being used over months and months, and essentially the, the, the strategies, as you say, are so sophisticated. You know, a lot of people have said people will vote as they do. You know, a couple of misinformation or directed emails using some Facebook data can't swing anything. But if you actually look at this, the, the kind of swing vote that they had to address, it was only 70,000 votes that they had to target. And it was not to target people. You're not going to switch somebody from who's, you know, um, going to vote Democrat to vote Republican or something like that. All it was was getting people not to come and vote. That's all they had to do. So 70,000 across about five or six states and you could actually swing an election of that size. So, I mean, this has become very sophisticated, as you say. Um, you know, addressing it on a once-off, one-by-one thing that you pick up as, as fake news, because um, these social platforms have set up, um, you know, kind of um, help or appeal desks where you can get take down, you know, you can get take down notices and get that um, stuff taken down. But actually, to identify this sort of systemic um, undermining of democratic processes, and which has been described by you know, the person who blew the uh, Brexit issue um, on The Guardian as kind of you know, one of the biggest threats to democracy um, that we have currently. So I think just in that context, um, Eli Chanza, perhaps you would just, uh, I think the uh, Commissioner might also like to come back to it, but um, not most governments, most information regulators have really struggled with um, how to deal with fake news, even when it's out there. How do you know you prevent it? So we've got these very stringent, effective um, electronic and press media rules about non right. But how do you deal with, with, with social media? And I thought quite uh, um, innovative, maybe not kind of entirely effective, but I think there were some interesting cases. Um, in the last election, the information regulator, together with um, the Media Monitoring Project, actually had a, like, a helpline, a call line, um, in which you could report fake news or misinformation. And then the information regulator could, regulator could work very quickly then to try and get takedown notices, etc. Obviously, it's incremental. But I think it's some initiative in this kind of overwhelming situation. And I wondered, Ellie, if you'd like to speak maybe to that and some other issues around how we can use the... Um, social media or social networks for um, democracy, but also safeguard our rights and, and defend our interests. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, with a fun fact, actually. Um, I wonder if anyone here knows that there are many mobile phones in the world than toothbrushes. Um, yes, it's true. And um, so this is something we boast about, but I understand clearly that uh, in anything that we call development comes a consequence with it. So um, uh, like the previous panels, I, I reckon I could say, uh, there's a French quote I could say, chacun's a problem. Uh, so we, these generations, we all have our own problems and challenges. Now it's, it is um, we, the people that have to tackle them. Now, out of the world's population of 7.4, you know, the 4.4 uh, no, billion people are, remain unconnected. And uh, with uh, 
for instance, the Africa region, 16% of the people are not connected. Now, this is uh, following so many reasons. One of them is uh, uh, localization. You know, my mom wouldn't find anything interesting online if it's not localized. Uh, what for? But something else is about skills training, digital literacy, infrastructures, the lack of infrastructures, as well as cost. Um, furthermore, is it relevant to, to, to us or not? So these are some of the reasons people remain unconnected online to date. But uh, apparently we have uh, 2.7 billion social media users in the world now, uh, out of 7.6 people in the world. Now this is a number that we shouldn't despise. Um, coming to election and what can we do? I realize uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, just to quote President Magufuli, the chair of SADC currently, uh, my president, uh, uh, he been wishing uh, at some point that uh, angels could descend from heaven and shut down the internet. You know, it's that's how he hates it. Uh, but at some point, he's been uh, quoted saying, uh, "We are facing with we are faced with a lot of regulations just to control people, which is not good because uh, the more we want to control people, the more we are stopping development from happening." And now, what does it imply? Uh, as, uh, as much as we are looking onto regulating properly uh, to stop interference of elections or anything in, the di in this digital world, uh, we have to make sure any regulation is uh, uh, fostering the development of the people. Take, for instance, in Tanzania, we currently have uh, uh, the Electronic and Postal Communication Act, uh, which has uh, resulted to having an online content regulation. Which means if you're a blogger and you want to write anything intended for users in Tanzania, to be consumed in Tanzania, you ought to be registered with the Communication Regulatory Authority. Uh, I wish it was free, but it's not. So if you have a YouTube page, if you have a SoundCloud, SoundMark, any audio streaming service uh, account, and if you have a blog, those are three separate uh, things that you have to register with the uh, uh, authority uh, and around $450 per one service. Now I'm imagining um, uh, how many youth are failing to write about development, how many people are failing to uh, write about anything of fun as a hobby. Journalism students back in universities where they have to practice how to write online and uh, explore the digital uh, media, new media technologies, and now they can't. So as much as we're regulating, uh, we have to be aware of uh, um, how are we stopping or how are we fostering developments. I understand in 2016 in Uganda, but also in 2011, uh, they started to shut down the internet, and then in 2016 they heightened. Now I'm wondering, uh, come 2021, what will happen? Because we, we know uh, our Baba, uh, uh, Museveni, He's always there contesting, so I wonder if he's contesting or I don't know. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, so 2021, what will happen again? Uh, and what happens when the internet is shut down? Uh, by show of hands, I know comrades from Zimbabwe might have experienced, by two hells have experienced a total internet blackout in this in this room. Okay, Cameroon. Okay, it is scary uh, for those who have experienced. I mean, it's like there's no power, there's nothing you can do because we currently have been dependent to the internet and now you cannot swipe, you cannot withdraw, you cannot pay for your bills electronically. You can, you can basically do nothing than wait in a different world, in different states where you don't know what's happening outside because there's no TV, there's no radio, there's no nothing. Uh, so uh, as much as these regulatory and frameworks are put in place, they are the ones also which are stopping people, which are stopping youth, because youth are uh, major users of the internet. And uh, something interesting to people, I realize if I'm free to stay in this room for the whole week, I'm free, no problem. But if I'm, but if I'm forced to stay in this room for a whole week, I mean, that's, that's something else. It's, it's trouble, it's jail. Now that's something we're experiencing, uh, and I have to do something about it. So when people are uh, normally pushed back, it's like a cat, you're cornering it in a room, it has to do something eventually. And so that is why we are seeing a lot of, a lot of uprising, a lot of uh, issues coming up and uh, 
making social media look awful, look bad, not good for our continent, our block. But as a matter of fact, if we were free and if my leaders, our leaders, not rulers, if our leaders stood up front and said, please speak out of any injustice you see, report them using the mechanism that you have online, anywhere, and we shall take care of them. I think that could result into uh, lowering a number of injustice and human rights violations in our countries. So now while we are suppressing it, I mean, apart from watching cat videos online, yeah, we have to uh, do something actively challenging you. Uh, but I understand that it might be the intergenerational gap. So as much as we are seeking wisdom from our elders, uh, they might also need to, uh, you know, we, we they need guidance from us, what how we perceive the social media. And so they ought not to create regulations by themselves. Let them involve us. And I think many of uh, the challenges that uh, Commissioner explained here might be reduced as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I mean, I think we, you know, we're seeing an interesting intersection between these um, retrogressive sort of irrational taxes um, and human rights and control of, of um, social control. So if you actually look at the blogging rights, I mean, I don't think they're actually expecting to generate a lot of revenue. I believe the blogger's license is actually $900. Um, so are they obviously they just that's a social control issue. But if you look at Uganda with the social networking taxes, and I should add that about in in the least developed countries, the um, correlation between social networking and internet is almost complete. So it's about like 99.9% .9 of people who are on the internet are on the internet for social networking. I mean that's what's driving social networking take up. Sadly, not government services or <laughs> these other things, but that's what's driving it. And exactly in Uganda, the majority of people who are t taking up the internet are urban youth. So it's definitely, you know, these are the, also the activists and dissidents um, in those societies. And so there's definitely the use of these, um, as I say, quite irrational taxes to... Um, control, for, for social and political control purposes. Interestingly, in the Uganda case, it's kind of very schizophrenic, and I'm still looking around for the permanent secretary from Uganda who is going to try and join us, precisely to, to speak about the impacts of, of the social networking taxes and um, also a government's attempt, you know, um, in um, President Museveni's um, declaration on, on the taxes. He said it was also to control gossiping. So Treasury was trying to drive... Um, revenues, um, which, by the way, have been entirely counterproductive because people have firstly gone on to VPNs, so they're not doing that, or they've actually stopped using data. And so for the first time, MTN has actually re revealed their revenues because they've had a loss in revenues. So they're also paying less company tax. So not only have they not generated those taxes, people have actually found alternative ways of, of going online and, and, and using the internet because they digitally savvy and, and can do so. But the um, impact is actually that, you know, the, it's the poor that are using social networking because the high cost of, of, of um, other forms of services and data, communication services, text and, and voice, if they buy very small bits of data, it's still cheaper using WhatsApp and voice substitutes than buying those services. So it's really impacted negatively on the digital Uganda vision of bringing everyone online and having all services online, you know, by 2020 were some of the um, targets. Um, but I think, you know, I think this um, issue of uh, social control and obviously, as I said, this income generation is an interesting one. But you were mentioning, you know, which countries had had shutdowns. I think Cameroon was um, shut down, nearly went on for nine months of the year, um, uh, a year before last, I think it was last year. Um, and of course, Uganda had the shutdown for their elections and yeah, as I said, you know, in, in the case of Kenya, the previous election, was, which was actually SMS, not internet-generated, um, you know, uh, violence, um, there's a, there may be a rationale, but what we need is the governance and you know, regulatory and data frameworks that enable a legal process, so that if there is a shutdown, there has to be an independent judicial um, intervention in that process or something, but you can't just have, um, you know, the governing party deciding when or, or not the, the internet shut down. So the Kofi Annan Foundation has done some work on, on 
digitization and elections, I believe. Um, I wonder if you just give us some of those, tell us some of the implications of those shut, um, shutdowns at election time. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think the work of the Govindan Foundation in this area sprang from our pre-existing work on the integrity of elections, which Mr. Inan had set up following his role in the Kenyan elections. And he realized, especially after the elections in the States, Trump and the Brexit referendum, that actually uh, this was becoming a big issue and that people didn't know exactly how to grapple with this issue. You mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. People talk of a digital revolution and no one quite knows um, how to handle it. And there's a risk of um, either laissez-faire, and we've seen, we've seen many of the consequences of that, but there's also a risk of uh, overreacting and it being abused by certain regimes to justify clampdowns on freedom of speech um, and other freedoms and human rights violations of all sorts. So the idea of Mr. Inanist was to get a group of high-level commissioners who would represent different sectors. So it includes people from the tech sector, such as, for example, the former director of security of Facebook or uh, President Obama's chief technology officer, but also people from politics, from uh, international relations, um, a mix of people from developing countries, uh, well-established democracies. Um, so to really try and get a, a grip, and these people being advised by experts uh, from around the world, um, and the, the work is being done mainly, the research work is being handled by a small team of researchers at Stanford University, and they've done missions all around the world, different parts, to understand the issues. Um, and they should come out with a, a report, which will be launched probably in January next year. And one of the foci of the work of the commission at Mr. Anand's explicit request was to look specifically at how these issues are playing out in, in developing countries. And of course, I think he had uh, Africa for, first and foremost in mind, having had personal experience of how these uh, issues are playing out on the continent. Now, the commission is still doing work, but I think from all the discussions we've had with the commission and the experts whom we've um, you know, asked for advice and comment, is I think Africa faces a number of, of specific challenges, which are not only unique to Africa, but which are particularly um, pre prevalent in Africa. And these are my own views rather than the commissions, but from what I've read so far, I'd say uh, one would be, of course, the, the uh, huge uh, preponderance of youth on the continent. So I think that just because of this high presence of youth, and we know the disproportionate use of these social media and internet platforms uh, by youth, it means that this issue is an even bigger issue on the continent uh, than in uh, graying and aging continents. Um, second, I think, specific ca characteristic of, of Africa is the huge stakes of elections. Over the past two days, we've talked about how um, often the state is the fastest and best route, not just to power, but also to wealth, and everything stems from controlling the state. We've talked about this the past two days. Of course, this is a caricature. It varies from country to country, but still, the, the, the stakes of actually winning power are particularly uh, big um, here, um, and so therefore, I think the temptation to try and manipulate and use uh, and abuse uh, social media and internet, particularly big. And the same, you mentioned the role of um, Cambridge Analytica in Kenya. The same companies that are providing such services to the likes of Trump and others are actually active on the continent. Because the stakes are so high, politicians are willing, of course, to spend a lot of money to get the best technology and the best people they can out there. A third characteristic of Africa, I think, is that um, the, the capacity, the regulatory infrastructure already in today um, concerning existing technologies is not as strong as it could be. And so therefore the regulatory environment for these new technologies simply doesn't exist. Um, another factor I think which is, makes it, this issue particularly salient on the continent is, is the, the volatility of, of identity politics uh, on the continent. Um, we've seen one of, the, some, one of the studies showed that internet and social media that doesn't create new issues but it can exacerbate existing issues and issues of identity politics are already very strong, uh, whether it's sectarian, ethnic, these cleavages are very strong, and they've in the past led to all kinds of uh, issues, you know, massacres, um, whatnot, uh, violent intercommunal inter clashes. Well, if you add to that combustible mix the existing of echo chambers, uh, social media, closed WhatsApp group, which can spread uh, you know, disinformation and hate speech virally, um, that, that's particularly <laughs> explosive in a continent where you already have these issues. And a final issue, I think, which I think makes this issue particularly important in Africa, is the question of trust. I think that because uh, 
I think there's a certain degree of, and we've talked about this the last two days, trust in institutions, trust in governments is not particularly high. And so we were at a, a consultation in, in West Africa recently where we had a, a media boss who told us that people said, we don't trust the newspapers in our country, but we trust Facebook. Uh, people are willing to, uh, they don't trust the analog institutions, and therefore they, a lot of them trust the digital world more than they do their analog reality, which opens huge avenues for potential uh, misuse. Um, and the same, uh, this question of trust also applies to election commissions, which in many countries are not trusted. So when election commissions are going to try and regulate these things or implement new technologies, uh, because trust levels are already not very high, I think a lot of voters are going to immediately suspect that there's foul play at hand or people are going to try and use uh, you know, servers, try and use these things to manipulate the outcome. So in fact, the, the technology plays into a much bigger issue of, of trust in, in political systems. So th these are just uh, personal reflections on why I think this question of social media and the internet um, are going to play a particularly big role in Africa and why this commission hopefully will play a, a useful role in providing all kinds of policy makers across the continent, whether national, regional election commissions, with maybe some tools and guidelines to bear in mind when thinking of how to respond to these challenges, which will become more and more important, even if today the level of connectivity is low. Um, I think a bit like uh, cell phones and, and now smartphones, I think they'll spread very, very fast. And especially since this is driven by youth, I think that it'll go very fast. And I think we need to address these issues and find ways of dealing with these challenges around the world, but especially in Africa, very, very fast in order to keep up with the, uh, with basically the, the, the gamekeepers have to keep up with the poachers, which is always a, a challenge. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's also, you know, it's, it's such a problem when we speak about Africa and, and try and sort of generalize and that, because it, right. it is so um, complicated and different. So um, as uh, Research ICT Africa, we do these nationally representative surveys that not only look at connectivity, but also now look at cybersecurity awareness, mobile money, a whole lot of things. Um, but it, interestingly, and, and, and at data protection and data awareness, um, interestingly, quite differently amongst different countries, and it was always surprisingly sometimes, um, some of, the, some of the, in the majority of responses in some of the countries was actually, well, we'd much rather have the social networks have our information than our government. You know? yeah. So there was that issue. But then interestingly, you know, countries um, like Nigeria and Kenya, which are facing physical threats of terrorism and those kinds of things, seem to be much more willing for the government to have sort of, you know, unconstrained surveillance sort of opportunities in that, believing that they could catch people in there. So it's, it's very, very, this trust issue is very, very interesting and very contextual, I think, um, in, in these cases. I just wanted to take some questions from the floor before people responded in, in their closing remarks, probably to each other's comments, because I think there were some very overlapping issues there. Yes. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I got <laughs> carried you. away. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, p uh, panel. I like this discussions about the digital age because it's not going away. So we have to become very comfortable with it. Uh, now, Habermas spoke about openlichheit, meaning openness, openicity, that which is open or accessible to everyone for public deliberation. So this should be actually a transformative tool or power of discourse and connector of civil society. We spoke about civil, civil society this morning and here you hear how um, the digital, digital age is so important in that connectivity. Um, unfortunately for us in South Africa, it's, data is very expensive. But lastly, what I want to say is, um, the capacity of social media may help to general, generate or generalize trust in society and in government and comp competence like elections. Now, events like elections are a form of democratic participation accomplished via media technologies to hold corporations and states accountable. Now, I know the one spoke about trust, but I mean, I think that in this digital age that um, 
we would hope that we could be eth ethical. Ethics plays a big role in a digital age. So, um, and along with that goes trust and competence. So, um, my question to the panel is how, in a way, forward could we use this very big piece of technology in a way that's going to reach the citizens to hold tabs on election processes, on government, on accountability? Because, to be honestly speaking, that's the easiest way to do it. Before, it used to be in the village from hand, you know, from mouth to mouth, etc. But now, uh, we just need to click on a button, and it's there. And South Africa had these ESCOM blackouts. It was a nightmare, because we're no longer used to the normal form of communication. Thank you. Some questions here in the front. Good afternoon. Pascal Holliger from the Swiss Embassy in Harare, Zimbabwe. Yeah, incidentally, as you were uh, talking on the panel, I just got a, an email from the Agence France Presse AFP, which says misleading social media posts about the anti-migrant violence gripping South Africa have been spreading across the continent, fueling tensions that have already sparked reprisal attacks in Nigeria. Tens of thousands of Facebook and Twitter users have watched videos showing people frantically jumping out of a burning building. If the captions are to be believed, the footage shows the deadly violence in Johannesburg. In fact, it was not filmed in South Africa at all, but in India. It shows a horrific fire in the western Ind Indian city of Surat, which killed 20 teenagers in May. Now, applied to the elections, um, one can see how fast situations can get out of control. And so I think you've done an excellent job of diagnosing the advantages, disadvantages, challenges, and opportunities of the digital age. Um, maybe as you, as you reply to some of the questions, I'd be interested to learn more about some of the avenues to address uh, the challenges that have been that have been listed. Now, I know, Sebastian, you mentioned the, the work of the commission, will, which will come out in, in January or early next year. Are there already some pre-information that you can that you can give us just to get us thinking about you know some of these things? And uh, I know the, the moderator mentioned um, you know some of the legal aspects around sur uh, surrounding the use or the shutdown of internet around elections. Can you elaborate maybe on more measures that could be taken? Uh, to make sure that situations, you know, are handled in a way that ensures stability and security without uh, restricting, completely restricting the rights of, of, of citizens. Thank you. I think we have a question at the back and then another one in the front. Uh, so this, is, my question is uh, to the gentleman from the Electoral Commission. I just wanted to get... Your name and maybe your organization. Okay, uh, my name is Mandir. I'm from the Graduate School of Business of the University of Cape Town. Uh, so my question is uh, around the cost of infrastructure. So I believe um, uh, electronic voting basically relies to a significant degree on issues of infrastructure. Uh, I just want to get a sense of what the average cost of investment might be to have a backbone a database um, of biometrics um, before you can actually even, you know, have the, um, the electronic voting actually implemented. So just, just the cost and what should be financed first. Thank you, um, panelist. And um, I was just thinking when uh, Sebastian made the point about trust and uh, the person who wouldn't trust the newspaper but would trust Facebook. And I thought to myself, if the editor um, had a Facebook page, then maybe the gentleman in question would not trust the hard copy, but then would read the same newspaper article on Facebook and believe that version. Um, anyways, uh, that's a way of saying that elections and politics and democratization, it's all about people. And if we don't build trust in people, uh, it doesn't matter the level of technological sophistication. We're not going to be able to bring people along. And we've seen in a number of cases that even the use of technology has, in a society where there is not trust or where people don't have confidence in the election administration, that the usage of technology only heightens the level of mistrust. 
And so my question to the panelists and, and others is, um, should we be investing more? Because I, I get the sense there's a, there's a digital generation out there, the youth, they're into their sophisticated technology, uh, whether it's doing um, PVTs, for example, parallel vote tabulations, which are very uh, technology intensive, and they collect data and they record and report on data in real time. Uh, but if the rest of the electoral stakeholders are not brought along and they don't buy into the process, at the end of the day, you don't really impact their behavior and you, you may not contribute to bringing them along to helping improve on the electoral process. So my question is, should we also be investing a lot of effort in just educating our populations and other stakeholders that are outside the brackets of this digital generation so that we can bring them along, so we can build a critical mass that then sees the value that technology and the usage of you know, data and digital technology, sorry, brings to electoral processes across Africa. Yes. Uh, Fabio Diaz from Rhodes University. Uh, at the beginning of the session, the, uh, there was this discussion about the access of information. Do you think maybe we should make a distinction between information and data? Information is knowing what is happening in the country, real facts. Data is kittens and memes and the information about what is happening in the country. For those questions, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to um, respond in, in their closing remarks. Um, I think there were some specific questions around elections. Um, Commissioner, if you'll take those. And then um, there were also questions around cost, which maybe some people can pick up. There were questions around um, access to information. Hopefully, you can pick those up in your um, comments. And then I think there were some specifically directed at you, Sebastian, as well. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the, the question on what sort of infrastructure would be required and the cost to get to technology-enabled solutions <coughs> is a good one, but it's very nuanced in the subject matter. It's, it's really like asking how long should this piece of string be? It's, it depends on, on what we want. I have seen countries look for very complex solutions to very easy problems. I think we must use technology having considered what our real problem is that we seek to address. i give you an example. One of the things in this nation that we learned from Kenya in 2007 was that a head of an institution such as an election management body can, can be taken hostage and be given a piece of paper to say, announce the results, here's a television station, here's a radio station, make it known and get done with it, which can happen. We thought we should free our own commissioners and CEOs, and there was a pretty simple solution. We took the result slip, scanned it into um, a simple system. We only needed a scanner in, 200, in 280 offices across the nation, and that result slip as signed by party agents, was immediately available on the internet. If you took me hostage and your government and you said, you announce these results, people will still see the actual result, whether I'm there or gone. Simple solution, cost, absolutely minimal cost. But there are people who would look for something similar and define a very expensive process. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the way we think about it. 
and we want to think of an election being a great equalizer that even poor people can interface with it and feel no cost of doing so. There was a question raised about what we do to get to technology, and I, I just want to be very naughty. Um, No, no, this is not technology, it's just uh, a, an interesting uh, uh, thing. <laughs> President, former President Jacob Zuma, last year in November, or thereabouts, made a profound thing, I think it's profound because he made it, you know, and said, oh my goodness, I'm not, I have not been on Twitter, and people are passing me in conversations, I'm going to learn to tweet. He tweets every day now. He felt there was something happening. He needed to interface with it. That was intrinsic motivation. And I accept that, um, you know, technology has, it's no longer that difficult you know, you, you no longer need to go to school to, to learn how to operate, the, you know, it's, it can become very easy. And I think part of the incentive we have to make as society, institutions that provide services must be to make it so elementary for people to interface with it because the value of the information they get is not painful or the pain they, they'll go through to get that value, it's absolutely minimal. And that, I think, is a challenge for every one of us that are serving um, communities and citizens. The, yeah, I think those were the issues that were limited to me. Thank you. I'm yeah. going to just get some of the answers from somebody else, and maybe we can come back to some yes. of you. But Ellie. I was just wondering if you have a question in mind, but perhaps also to address the question of um, bringing other, others than those who have been referred to as the digital natives along, <laughs> along with us. <laughs> agree more to, I couldn't agree more to that statement because uh, right now many of our governments in Africa are rolling out what they are calling uh, e-government. And so many of the services are widely available online. So if uh, we, we, should we educate others? So that is out of the question. Yes, we have to bring any, everybody on board, especially uh, right now we're turning into Internet of Things, trying to operate our devices autonomously. And uh, so we, we all have to know about the Internet, about how it operates, including how to protect ourselves online, because I think that is where many of us fail, exposing everything publicly without knowing, and then uh, all the details being used against us. But we are grateful, for instance, for many companies adopting the uh, European Data Protection Regulation, for instance, Article 17, which talks about right to be forgotten. So many, compas many companies normally withhold our information, and when they are done with the use of it, they just hold on to it. It's like the, the custodians of our information. When we don't want, when we do not know, so, and this is done through different applications, through different uh, services provided online, especially free services. Uh, I think we might recall uh, one of a program which uh, uh, many people used to, to, you know, take photos and turn themselves into like 50 years later, how would I look, how old could I look? But again, without reading the terms of services, which means all the details, all the photographs taken there are in the custody of the company and then may use, they may use the photos whenever they want for advertisement purpose, for scientific research purpose, for any purpose best known to them. So the community, yes, we have to bring everyone on board and educate about uh, the ABCs of the internet. But just to react to another question about uh, misleading information, uh, I'll say there are some institutions taking advantage of this, like blah, 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 Pascal just tweeted this is wrong and you know we have to do something about this and block everything. 
But again, we have people like the master, the, the Twitter in chief, uh, uh, Trump. So uh, it's like trolling every now and then, you know, averting people to lies and using everything uh, against the people. Like, we, we need to know our agenda is this, but uh, uh, agenda setting. In journalism, we have something called agenda setting, uh, whereby I decide what you have to know. But now that could work if it's uh, uh, a newspaper, a well-known newspaper, and it has presence online, we will definitely get information from it. If it's just an anonymous person online, we have to verify. Do you know that person? If yes, you do know that person, why not hold him or her accountable to what have been said. I think we could go to, uh, we could have a proper line and that could be a road ahead for us to be free online uh, in this era. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think we are, I'm wondering if you might want to sp speak to the question of um, data protections and uh, harms and risks and how we might mitigate them. Oh, okay. Um, I do concur with you that we do need to make a distinction between um, information and, and data. And when we are looking at um, access to information, what kind, what does that mean? What information is needed uh, if we are talking in terms of active participation? Um, but also when we are now looking at data protection, we need to define um, what kind of data, what categories of data need to be protected and, and, and why. And that has to be clearly defined within the law that um, speaks to, to, to that issue. For example, in South Africa, there is the um, uh, Protection of Personal Information Act, and it clearly defines what exactly um, is meant by personal information, what kind of data, all the safeguards. So the law does uh, define that. And I, I just also want to um, uh, respond to issues around what can be done um, as we are uh, embracing digital technologies in elections. Um, I just want to say um, I was unfortunate to be in the Gambia in, in 2016, where during elections and um, that period towards elections, and um, you could not access things like WhatsApp, Skype, you had to circumvent the, the blockade using VPNs. And um, during the day, on the day of elections, there was no internet whatsoever, or you could not even call, it was beyond internet, you could not even use, you call your family, and there I was, um, in West Africa, and my family in Zimbabwe could not even contact them. You don't, you don't even know what that means. You feel so insecure. Um, so um, in, in terms of then what can be done, we are looking at the legal framework. Because um, if, if you are then to say, uh, to, to restrict access to information, there will be at some point maybe to, to restrict information based on security grounds, national security grounds, and maybe that then leads to uh, blocking internet or shutting down internet completely. So in terms of human rights standards, it has to be, to, it has to pass a three-part test at least. It has to be within the law. So the law has, it, somebody, it doesn't have to be this discretion of, for example, a minister, like what happened in Zimbabwe where uh, the minister of sex security ordered an internet shutdown without the law providing for that. So it has to be within the law. It has to serve a legitimate purpose. And it has to be necessary in a democratic society. And it has to pass through those tests. Then um, you can take such measures. But then they have, they have to be exceptional circumstances. Um, so we, we need to look into our legal frameworks and see if they are really safeguards, um, you know, when you're looking at, th at that area. And then in terms of course, we have um, appreciated that technology has really revolutionized the electoral uh, processes and, and electoral systems, but also there are costs that are involved. For example, wh when you are looking at issues around information that is collected, um, there is need for cyber security, and there is need for, for, for the government to be deliberate in that area and invest, invest in cyber security in terms of the law and in terms of also educating also um, those that are responsible for making sure that that, that information is secure. And also um, issues around risk management, because computers can break down and you need um, a, a government uh, or 
you know, resources allocated to, towards that process. So there is need for, 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 for the government to really commit um, resources towards this. Because when you are looking at issues around, especially internet, there is hacking, which makes data vulnerable. So there is a lot of investment that the government uh, needs to do in terms of resources, financial um, and human. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, Sebastian, would you like to respond to some of those questions before we close off? Not really. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't no. have to, but no. I think there no. were some that were directed at you. <laughs> it's true. Um, I, I'm afraid that I really can't give you much of a preview of what the Commission will do. Um, we, we've commissioned a lot of research, a lot of work's been done, but the idea is to keep our, our powder dry until we actually release the report, um, and then they have to wait all the different evidence and all the different information they've had. Uh, we're going to actually have a consultation with the European Commission in October. Uh, they're often seen as uh, kind of in the lead on these regulatory um, issues. Um, but I think that the spirit of the Commission, and I think that'll be reflected in the end, is that uh, this is a new uh, field, and like every new uh, scientific advance, it poses, it presents both uh, novel advantages and new challenges. And so we have to find a way of making the most of, of the powers of the internet and social media for information, participation, and, and mobilization of the citizenry, particularly youth, which we know tends to vote less and be less active in, in formal politics. But on the other hand, we also have to protect our institutions, our electoral processes from the potential dangers. And the solution, I think, will not be... Uh, an, uh, it'll be to try and find a balance and also work with the technology sector to find uh, solutions and a middle ground between the excesses of either laissez-faire and, and you know, full state control clampdown on the internet that some states attempted to do, to resort to around election time. Well, thank you for that. I'm sorry that even if we applied Chatham rules, we couldn't get some insights into <laughs> your report, but we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to uh, wait and wait and Get, um, get it. I just wanted to uh, pick up on some of the questions that were, were directed to us and maybe just some quick responses by way of summary of this very interesting session. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, just in regard to your question on, on, on the public sphere and this new public sphere, I think it really goes to the original points we were making about how public the sphere is. In fact, on the African continent, it's a very small minority of us. Even when we speak about, you know, um, digital, about youth driving um, digital take-up, um, we're talking about tiny portions of the population, really urban educated youth, you know, in Kampala, and barely any sort of connectivity outside, um, you know, youth in Dar es Salaam, et cetera, at universities, et cetera. So we, this public sphere at the moment, it has potential, of course, of participation at relatively low cost in time, but at the moment it's not really an equal or open public sphere at all. Um, just on the, on the issues of... Um, you, you were saying, you know, that if we... It has to, we have to get to set up these legal frameworks and you have to sort of pass these thresholds and then, you know, we can actually um, find mechanisms in order to at least limit some of the harms and, and the risks associated with that. But I think one of the problems, especially with our um, sometimes sort of quite uncritical adoption because it's good policy like GDPR, um, like, like the European Commission's um, data protection um, regulations, is that they are designed for completely different contexts. Mm -hmm. And so we work with assumptions of universal access, of mature competitive markets, of democracy and of human rights. And, you know, although many of the countries that we've been speaking about have electoral democracy, in fact, um, you know, why we expect online rights when people actually can't exercise their offline rights is a bit kind of bizarre, it's a little bit odd. Um, but perhaps there's potential because of this, to actually um, use um, social networks, you know, digital platforms, um, and the um, human rights frameworks in which they're being required to operate, to actually drive um, governments towards, um, you know, free and fair open elections, more democratic participation by people, at least getting people access to, to, to services. Um, because I think what we haven't really dealt with here that much, because we've been sort of focused on elections, is that um, 
governance of global public goods like the internet actually require global governance. And this is a very tricky thing for many of our, Afri you know, our, our, our African countries because we've tended to operate in multilateral organizations as member states where we can do what we want, say what we want. You know, our vote counts the same as, as um, you know, Mr. Trump's. Um, and then we, in this global governance environment, we find ourselves in this multi-stakeholder environment where civil society has a voice that we're not used to having to listen to or, you know, um, you know, that we basically are not going to remedy these situations unless there is global cooperation. I mean, the only way we're going to address cybersecurity, issues of cross-border trade and taxation, are through global governance, through global cooperation. And so I think this presents a really big um, challenge for us from a policy perspective and also from a capacity-building perspective. And I suppose just from the you know, Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance, this is really a completely new area of um, research governance, research policy research, but also capacity building. So, you know, um, training um, officials, governments on new forms of, of, of governance and um, on, of course, digital awareness and around the various things that go with, go with that. So um, hopefully we are going to have lots more conversations um, on, the, on these issues and on these topics. Thank you so much for the input from the panel and from the floor. Thank you. I think uh, we can trust that your knowledge on this area is much, much beyond what uh, we could even get on Google. And that you have, uh, that the panel has put everything together in terms of convincing us that uh, we can make use of ICT, uh, digital technology, to enhance democracy, and also warning us of the dangers that continue to lag behind it, that it can actually be used to reverse the gains. So please help me thank Professor Jewald for such a... Yeah. I would like to excuse the panel as we move into the final session of our discussion. Um, we have concluded the final panel for the conference and we would like to take a few minutes to look back on what has happened uh, over the past two days just to extract some key takeaways from from the participants. Since yesterday, we spoke, we brought democracy under the lens. We did start with a very broad presentation which gave us an overview of the state of democracy on our continent in the region. We then zoomed to look at how it's implemented in practice and the mechanisms, the architecture that is supposed to make democracy work. We looked at the elections as a key element of democracy. Uh, today we looked at mainly participation and the tools for participation and inclusion. We spoke about youth, uh, young people, and we spoke about the technology that is used either to advance or to subvert democracy. There's so much under democracy, we cannot possibly cover everything in two days. But we want at least bit by bit, step by step, to see what it is that we can uh, take home with us and reflections that we can put on the table so that the next time that we meet, we may be able to look back and say, this is what we picked up last time. How far are we? So I would like to invite the house, if there are any of those sharp thoughts, not only on this particular session, but on the last two days. May I bring you back to the conference? <laughs> yes, um, I'll start with Chris. He came through to me in our two days of deliberations is the fact that this was a, an extraordinary conversation um, and we probably should find ways 
to have similar conversations in our respective countries. The conversation about democracy is not happening in countries across the continent because there was an assumption that once the first election was held or once the transition from military to civilian rule was realized, then everything else would flow and democracy in some ways was being taken for granted. I think this conversation here, as enriching as it has been, really underscores for me the need for us to find ways to stimulate conversations about democracy and the way forward in our respective countries, both at the local level in terms of people, ordinary citizens, as well as the national level in terms of other stakeholders, heads of institutions, and elected officials. Those conversations need to be happening in order to guarantee for democracy in our continent uh, a better and more prosperous and sustainable future. Thank you very much for those reflections. I will go to Jenny. Thank you, Chair. Um, I see there the road ahead. So, I mean, the gentleman on the right spoke about our wishes. Now, I'd like to just speak about the road ahead. I mean, this platform has been very good in um, reaching out to academia. Uh, we've seen the body of scholarship, and um, I presume there is going to be a report on the two days. And as a matter of reflection and evaluation, um, I would expect the next time round, as I briefly spoke to you about, um, how are we going to test these kind of platforms? How are we going to prove that some of the significant points are going to be used, like the gentleman on the right said, we're all going back to our various countries, to our communities. Because democracy really, I mean, South Africa is what, 25 years into democracy? But how, do we really engage about democracy? We've got the elders, we had a youth presentation, we spoke about civil society, the digital age. Now, I'm wondering, will there be a meeting point to have these various sectors or uh, stakeholders to be able to test one another? Are we actually on the right path? And are we going to achieve what has been set out by the goals that we have now laid out on the table? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come here to you, ma'am. Merci, Monsieur le Président de la Cérémonie. J'ai beaucoup appris. Je me suis conforté surtout par le fait de dire que la démocratie en Afrique centrale et en Afrique australe, les difficultés ne sont pas seulement de mon pays et que nous partageons le même problème. Donc, nous pouvons ensemble trouver des solutions. Moi, ma préoccupation après ces deux jours, c'est les suivis. Pour pas que cette conférence soit une énième conférence, nous terminons, nous rentrons chacun chez soi, et puis ça s'arrête là, on va reconvoquer, on va réinviter dans une autre conférence et nous parlons d'autres choses nous oublions l'autopsie que nous venons de faire ici. Sous contrôle des médecins qui peuvent se trouver ici, le rôle, l'importance de l'autopsie, c'est qu'on puisse déceler la pathologie et qu'à la prochaine fois, on réduise les cas de décès par rapport à cette pathologie. Nous avons fait l'autopsie de la démocratie en Afrique centrale et en Afrique australe. Nous avons décelé, si pas tout, mais certains points de faille. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas moyen d'avoir un petit comité de suivi ou un travail qui sera dirigé à la fois par la Fondation Nelson Mandela et la Fondation Kofi Annan Par exemple, comme quelqu'un, un panéliste avait dit ici, qu'il ne suffit pas seulement d'envoyer des observateurs au moment des élections, 
il faut plutôt au départ, tout au début, essayer de travailler avec les institutions en place, d'apporter des réformes, d'organiser les choses, de sensibiliser au respect des principes de démocratie, de sorte que lors des scrutins, nous puissions nous rapprocher des valeurs de démocratie. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas moyen qu'après cette conférence, qu'il y ait l'espèce de ces comités-là où nous allons faire le monitoring au niveau de l'Afrique centrale et australe pour les pays qui vont aborder les prochaines essayances électorales et que nous puissions un peu en amont, déjà une année, deux ans, trois ans avant, préparer ces élections pour que nous voyions si à l'interne, les, ces, ces pays concernés ne parviennent pas à avoir des failles, mais nous qui venons en appui à l'externe, nous puissions les aider à respecter les valeurs de démocratie. C'est ça ma préoccupation, les suivis après cette conférence. Merci beaucoup. Euh, oui, euh, moi je voudrais dire que j'ai beaucoup aimé les discussions pendant ces deux jours, mais sans vouloir être rabat-joie, je ne voudrais pas casser l'ambiance, je reste sur ma fin en ce qui concerne la démocratie en Afrique centrale. Euh, pourquoi Je vais un peu dans le sens de ma sœur qui vient de, de parler, c'est que je pense... En Afrique centrale, les élections, que ce soit en amont ou en aval, sont souvent chaotiques et on est toujours dans des sorties de crise. Et pour moi, ces sorties de crise sont relatives. Donc la démocratie n'avance pas du tout, je pense. Et donc, on peut évoquer les théories autant de fois qu'on veut, mais on doit pouvoir les intégrer véritablement. Et ce n'est pas le sentiment que j'ai. Donc, je pense qu'on doit redoubler d'efforts pour essayer d'être un peu plus près des réalités que ce que nous faisons. Vous l'avez entendu ici lors des débats, lorsqu'on parle de la RDC, mon pays, on dit euh, c'est pour privilégier la stabilité. OK, on ira ailleurs, on change les constitutions. Il y a des pays, dans notre pays, on n'avait pas accepté qu'on change la constitution. On a négocié autrement la sortie de crise. Donc je pense que nous devons continuer le dialogue sur ces questions de sortie de crise euh, en Afrique centrale. Merci. I think for me, what I take from the two days is that when we started, we say, what is the definition of democracy? So it's, it seems as we are not yet there to know what is democracy. Because some superior will, will shut other people and say, no, don't talk. You don't know anything about democracy. Most especially the issue of religion, that we said religion, we didn't see uh, religion being uh, discussed here. If they raise their voice, somebody who's a political will say, no, this is a political issue. It doesn't involve you. And then we heard about the civil society that they need to be redefined. Why do you want to be redefined? Because you know who you are as, as a civil society. You know what is your role? Play your role. Youth, you know your role? Play your role. Like the, the, now we are concluding about the digi digital age. To understand, somebody is going around paralyzing everyone because of power so that you don't say anything in, in the democracy. Because in the democracy, when we died, or people who died for democracy, what they were dying for? If, because if we're still struggling, we're still fighting in the era of democracy, I don't know why we're fighting for democracy. Because when we're fighting for democracy, we're saying we want to enter into a, a free environment, a free society. So, but we don't see that free society. We are still struggling, we're still fighting. So that is what I'm, I've observed here to say, we don't understand the democracy because it involves everyone, all of us. No one should shut somebody and say, you can't say anything because maybe I'm a politician or I'm a leader, I know better than you. We are all a body of democracy. People at the lower level, at, 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 in the rural areas, 
They are part of this. We cannot shut them down. We cannot tell them that we know better than you and we describe things for them. That is totally wrong and then we are not going to move with this, this democracy. We need to involve everyone, even if it's a small vein. We can, you cannot pull it out because it can cause a lot of havoc in our body. So we need everyone. That is what I take. Thank you very much, uh, Uh Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I mean, I will, I will also add my voice to those who have said this was uh, an immense investment in a conversation that we really needed to have. And I am not one to complain about what happens next, because what happens next is both individual in terms of what I will do back where I am. I believe that I've been drawn in here for a purpose. So likewise, everybody who is here, I think we have a responsibility to do something about what we have learned and improve the way we are working in our organizations, in our movements, and so on. And then collectively, I think, to place both gratitude on the Mandela School as well as Kofi Annan Foundation and those who are supporting that. Could we think about um, the idea of an annual conference on the state of democracy in Africa? And that the, the conversations we had today could start to formulate themes for the future. I think the conversation we ended on, uh, on the digital age and how it is impacting on democracy and governance is something that requires a lot more attention uh, in the next round, for example, if that was to be accepted as a, as a way forward. I also think that the conversation on leadership that has been coming through from day one, I think we might just need to zero our attention on that as a discussion plan to really evaluate why are our democracies producing the kind of leadership we have? Um, we really have right now a continental problem now with the reaction to what has happened in South Africa across the continent. And we are seeing uh, leadership by perspiration <laughs> and not leadership by inspiration as government leaders try to respond to the crisis of violence here. No inspiration. I would imagine if Nyerere was here today, we would have had something uh, that would rally the continent around and resolve this issue. So I think the next round really need to spotlight leadership as an issue. And then the final one is, uh, it was coming out in the conversation, including Greg Mills' uh, presentation, why our democracies and governance producing huge inequalities? And what are we actually doing to confront the urgent problem of inequality on the continent, uh, together with masses uh, and masses and layers of corruption? So going forward, I think we have really deposited a series of themes that can be taken by all of us in the work we do day to day and begin a process of enriching a possible next conference uh, that continues to enrich the way we are working, because that's what we want, right? To improve the way we are working so that we can have transformation on the continent. But I really have enjoyed the last two days. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I will go to Samuel to Leonard, and then end with the gentleman at the back. Okay, thank you. Um, let me join the previous speakers by commending the two institutions for putting this extremely valuable and insightful conference. Um, just three points of reflection. Um, the first is around the future of democracy. Um, and that as stakeholders, we should be concerned um, about the future of democracy that if our democracy does not deliver development to the people, we would wake up one morning and see that citizens are signing up and are embracing authoritarianism as the best form of government. And so it's a wake up call to us all um, to rethink democracy and walk towards ensuring that democracy delivers development to the people. And tied to that is the value um, of citizens in a democratic process, and that the future of, of democracy um, will be determined by that concept of we the people and what that um, really means. The second builds on what um, Depros talked about around leadership development or leadership and looking at reviewing our leadership recruitment, our leadership transition. Um, um, 
um, mechanism on the continent is, is one way to go. And to subsume this under the discussion around intergenerational dialogue and transition. And we've got to be intentional about how we, we build the future, both in politics, both in civil society, as well as in the academia and different spheres that we find ourselves, that we need to care about the future. Um, because with the kind of um, young people we have today, if we don't invest in building, um, invest in young people, then it means the future is, is really bleak. And, and the last point was around elections that the regularization of elections does not translate into democracy. And that citizens increasingly are losing faith in elections because as an instrument of holding leaders accountable. Therefore, we've got to revisit elections. We've got to ensure that we deepen the integrity of elections so that the votes of people count but not limiting their participation to elections, but looking at the entire spectrum of our electoral circle and ensuring that citizens participate in the process. Thank you very much, Samson. Um, I come to Leonard, then I go to the gentleman at the back. Um, thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, it's great that we have um, um, issues pertaining to democracy back on the table because for a long time we weren't hearing about it. So it's great that, um, especially in two very uh, important regions on the continent, that uh, we're getting a lot of stakeholders uh, to uh, bring this discussion back into the fold. But uh, building on what the gentleman said about bringing everyone together on this discussion, we see in this room we have like a lot of stakeholders. We have civil society, we have academia, um, the Congolese delegation even brought opposition people. but. We talk about political will, and all these discussions about democracy cannot be, we can't go on without having the people themselves in power, including the discussion, because it's like throwing water on a the, on the duck's back. So um, I know all of us would like that these discussions and um, uh, forums should, should continue, but in future, I just suggest that you know, we get representatives of these ruling parties and systems to be part of these discussions. You know, I'd like to see somebody who's a commissioner in the in Zanu PF or somebody from the ruling party in Cameroon or Congo Brazzaville to come by because we are amongst ourselves and we more or less have the same way of thinking with respect to democracy. You speak to them, they'll say that wait, no, we have established a democratic system because what we have established now is way better than what we had twenty to twenty five years ago or thirty years beyond. So they also have their own way of thinking, and it's good that they actually need to understand that, okay, you know what, this is what is on people's minds, because in their spaces, you know, they become very, um, I don't want to say sh uh, short-sighted of things, but then it's good that in this kind of um, symposium, you get all stakeholders together. We can't just neglect, especially since it's with them that, you know, the final decision usually resides. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Uh, so thank you very much again. Uh, m my name is Mundia uh, from the GSB. Uh, I just have two qu quick contributions. Um, so the first one pertains to the issue. So I, yes, I'd like to thank the organizers as well for doing a phenomenal job in getting the conversation started. Uh, so my two contributions are just simply that, first and foremost, uh, as we basically proceed from this particular workshop uh, conference, we basically would look into the countries a bit more de in a bit more detail. Um, and then, of course, um, set up communities of practice uh, where we can actually exchange knowledge um, that would basically, you know, and best practices in each and every sphere that we basically would be interested in. So that, those are my two contributions. Thank, thank you very much. I will give you the last word. Uh, I'll be very brief. I also want to um, convey my gratitude to the organizers of uh, this remarkable gathering. And uh, for me, uh, I think we have to uh, continuously um, to, to continue the process of engagement, talking about these issues that we, we raised, issues around youth participation, issues around the digital age. And um, 
I, I just want to, to, to take this opportunity to say um, where we are coming from with my colleague Bonolo, um, the Center for Human Rights also uh, provides platforms uh, for engagement through short courses on, on human rights. Some of them are, um, are funded, most of them. So you can check the website. There are courses on civil society and um, other human rights, um, uh, other human rights thematic areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to believe that we have exhausted all the reflections in the room. Um, and the organizers of the conference, I think the, a report will be put together and we are very grateful to uh, Ashanti and Leonard. We have been faithfully documenting the processes. Um, before I invite Professor Faisal to, to come and, uh, and close this part of the conference, uh, I just want to to end with a short uh, reflection uh, so that when we go back, we are not only thinking of the Wailing Wall. There has been a lot of investment in democracy from colleagues here present. And it is really possible that after these critical conversations, you may feel like you are pushing a wall. Uh, sometime in 2011, I met a gentleman by the name uh, Dietrich Fischer uh, in my studies. He is late now, may he so rest in peace. And he introduced me to, to Johann Galtung, um, whose teaching on peace studies has um, helped me in terms of uh, um, stimulating creativity. So Johann Galtung told me this story, which I thought I, I should share with you about the black hole. So, when, when Johan, who is now uh, widely recognized as the founder of the academic discipline of peace uh, studies, when he founded the first International Peace Research Institute in Oslo in 1959, he and his colleagues used to send copies of their working papers regularly to about 400 social science institutes around the world. And this included the Institute for World Economy and International Relations in, in, in Moscow, IMEMO. They received acknowledgments from all over the world about their work, but they had nothing from Moscow. It was as if the papers were disappearing into a black wall, leaving no trace. Despite this lack of feedback, Johan and his friends uh, continued to produce those papers and sending the papers to Moscow, among other uh, 400 institutes. And these papers, they carried alternative approaches to peace security development, and they did this throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. In 1982, Johann Galtung was invited to attend a conference at IMEMO in Moscow. And during the break of that conference, the librarian at IMEMO took him to the back of the library, opened a locked cabinet, and inside the locked cabinet, there was another locked cabinet, and inside, he showed him a pile of papers. Here was the entire collection of the papers that they had produced over decades, and they had been sending to them. The black hole had finally been identified. But surprisingly to them, the papers were all worn out and torn out from having passed through so many hands. The edges were bent and torn, with portions underlined and the numerous notes in the margins. Then in 1991, Vladimir Petrovsk, the former Soviet deputy minister, visited Johann Galtung in Oslo and he said, I really wanted to tell you that once we are very grateful to you. We received all your papers that you kept sending us, even though we would never be able to respond. During the Brezhnev era, I was part of the group of young scholars at Imemo we met frequently to discuss new ideas and we studied your papers intensively among many others. We knew that our system needed a reform, but we had no clear ideas what form of those reforms you'd take. You provided us with valuable new concepts and concrete ideas on how to proceed. The end of the World War had many sources, but your ideas played an important role. 
So that's the story of the black hole. So it is easy to feel like we are pushing a wall, like we are sending ideas into a black hole, but I think it's very important for us to keep doing this and that someday it might take a while and it probably will not happen in our lifetime, but we will find the black hole. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite uh, Professor Faisal, who is going to tell us the way forward. Thank you very much. Well, let me first invite um, Alan Doss to join me, uh, because I think we are uh, co-conspirators <laughs> in this project <laughs> and in uh, hosting you together here today, and um, so that we may jointly um, share some thoughts <clears throat> on on the way forward. I um, well, I, I personally um, I have uh, already. Um, tasted the fruits of uh, the, um, uh, the, the successful outcome of this conference because you have really enriched my own mind. And as the new director of the Nelson Mandela School, I really uh, appreciate very much the uh, discourse, the debate, the very uh, rich um, uh, and um, very frank, uh, open, uh, discourse that we've had here, I think, has uh, you know enriched my own thinking <clears throat> uh, enormously. So thank you very much, firstly, to all of you, and perhaps we should give a big hand to all of you for your participation. <laughs> thank you. Well, you asked the questions, and then you also answered the questions. So I think you have already, um, you know, <clears throat> set the the path forward for, for us uh, in, the, in the many answers you have provided about um, ways in which uh, we could take this conference forward. Uh, so let me tell you perhaps in two or three minutes what uh, my own um, uh, take from the conference is. I, I thought that we did try, yes, to take stock of uh, democracy uh, in this sub-region, southern and, and central Africa over the last two days. But I think the questions that um, arose um, from the discourse was really more about um, social and political change and how that process takes place. That was the, the heart of the debate. There was some intergenerational dialogue about that, about change, it was all about change how does change take place um, and are we on the right path? I think many of you were asking. <laughs> we heard uh, from the great uh, professor, uh, um, the, both Brian's I think contributed certainly to my own uh, thoughts uh, about the need for uh, ideas and theory. Again, underlining the um, what I took myself from reading Kofi Annan, the importance of ideas, um, theory. Um, and um, I learned that, um, and I think we all learned, that we have to start from our history. So everything we, we have talked about has a context, a historical context, and that, was, that came out <clears throat> that the need to go back and, <clears throat> and see where we came from and the need to, to have a, 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 a political economy perspective, so a much more complex understanding of our own reality. We learned too about um, the process of change, and I think there were some wisdoms shared with us that um, it's both the strategy and the tactics. Sometimes we get lost in the moment and uh, in the middle of the trees when you are in the forest but we also need to stand back and take a, a broader view uh, <clears throat> of where we want to go, what is the path that we want to follow. We talked a lot about um, the social movements, um, the different stakeholders um, that 
need to participate, that we need to engage with, that we need to organize, mobilize, <clears throat> uh, and uh, make them agents of change. Um, and we talked about the, um, the state of our political uh, discourse, political institutions, political parties, um, and importantly, we talked about the state, the formation of the state, and spent a lot of time uh, uh, discussing the failed states, um, the erosion of um, democracy and state formation and rights that were built up over the years and then um, undermined, eroded, uh, destroyed, distorted in a whole range of ways. So um, quite a lot of issues there for, for discussion. And I love the, the, um, um, the phrase that somebody used about the need, the need to reclaim the democratic and developmental state so that we can once again utilize it to deliver on the um, economic and social changes um, and services that um, we require <coughs> that, uh, it to perform uh, to create the better life, which uh, is the hope of uh, all our people on the continent. So how do we reclaim the democratic state? <coughs> uh, that, is, uh, that is the big issue. Um, or how do we build greater resilience of state institutions so that they perform as they are required to do and we insulate them from state, state capture and corruption. So we didn't talk very much about the other pillar. When we talked about human rights, we said there are two uh, pillars to it, the democratic or civil rights and social liberties on the one side, and then of course, economic and social rights. And to advance those, of course, we need to also address the other side. We didn't have much discussion about that in this conference, about how is it that we can uh, drive the process of economic and social transformation on the continent? How is it that we can add value and beneficiate, uh, grow our economies, move up the value chain of production uh, so that we can improve the um, standard of living? of our people on the continent. We didn't quite address that, and we talked a little bit about some very interesting processes going on on the continent that hold the promise of creating this virtuous circle of growth and development. And I'm speaking, referring here to the regional uh, uh, integration project that's underway and the enormous potential that has, but also, if not done correctly, that it could also be another failed promise. So how do we get that on a path that it delivers? That again has not been um, discussed very much, but clearly we recognize that it's another important part of the discourse because if we don't improve uh, the economic and social conditions of people on the continent, then of course they will use the state as a as a site of accumulation because the economy is not going to be delivering and you're going to get um, a, um, too much of energy and innovation and skills of the people of the continent being misdirected towards uh, capture of state resources <laughs> and a distortion of our democracy and erosion of our democracy. So we have to try and get both those sides correct uh, into, into a proper balance. So a lot of issues uh, were discussed. I, for myself, I'm um, speaking aloud for our own school. We, we have to discuss this um, in more detail and reflect on this discussion. Uh, but I think the idea of an annual conference on the state of democracy is a really uh, a good idea. Um, it will also um, maintain you know, this network of people from around the continent. Um, and um, keep us um, exchanging views and ideas, the, the rich experiences that you bring here and we share with each other is uh, invaluable. 
So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's I think, an, a really good idea. Um, so that's something we can discuss further with uh, the Coffee Annan Foundation, see how we can take forward. Uh, we have, as you saw yesterday, um, the uh, uh, participation of uh, Krasa Marshall, and um, I had the good fortune of also meeting um, President uh, uh, Ricardo uh, Lagos from, from Chile, and I, I don't know the others, I've not had the opportunity to meet with them personally, but uh, the Coffee Annan Foundation has a very rich network of amazing people uh, f uh, across the world who are um, a source of knowledge, inspiration, uh, insight, and uh, how we um, bring that knowledge, but also the experience and knowledge from our own um, uh, leaders, um, activists um, on the continent. Uh, some of the freedom fighters from the liberation movements were still amongst us. <laughs> I'm sure we can contribute to that. But certainly, um, we do have, um, you know, activists, activists who can, um, you know, who are rich store of institutional knowledge and experience from which we should always be drawing on to help us advance as we go forward. So how, how we bring those two sides together so we can keep this intergenerational uh, discourse and dialogue um, and uh, learn from that, I think, uh, is, is another role that the annual, annual conference uh, can play. So uh, I'll leave that with you. From our school, we do have an alumni uh, of young people, the uh, Young African Leaders Program that uh, Mabel, Sitole, and uh, uh, Marianne uh, Cameron have been um, managing for us. And we'd be very happy to uh, build on that expertise and that experience. And our alumni, too, are a very rich network of um, people on the continent who um, can contribute and add to the discourse that takes place here. So I'll leave you with, with those ideas and ask Alan to um, share his thoughts with you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just start, of course, with, um, I do want to say it's really been a joy working with uh, Ismail and, the, uh, and uh, his team here at the university, particularly, but not only in Mabel. Um, you know, we do these things in different parts of the world, but this is, I can honestly say, it's been very uh, efficiently managed and run, and uh, we really are very pleased, and thank you again for the terrific support we've, we've received. Um, I do have to just say, again, our thanks publicly to the UN Democracy Fund, the Open Society Foundation, and to the Swiss government, who really gave us a lot of uh, behind the scenes help to get this off the ground. Uh, to all the moderators and speakers, I must say, it's been, again, a joy to listen to you all and to hear the, the interaction. People have been very frank, very open. Very articulate, very eloquent. Uh, I must say, I'm in envy of some of the speakers. Um, but I think above all the participants, um, you know, you've come from several countries in the su in the subregion and beyond. Um, you've brought something uh, I think very special to this conference. A lot of you are younger, if I may say. Of course, that's come from a very old man. But anyway, uh, and that has added energy. And I think most importantly, it's about the future which is what we're here to discuss. Um, I think that's, that's particularly important because I was just looking, I asked Sebastian to check the statistics. You know, the average age of a person alive in Africa Day is only 19.3 years. 19.3 years, which means the vast majority of Africans have no memory of colonialization. And increasingly in this country, they won't have any direct memory of apartheid, which is now, what, almost 30 years? and of the struggle and what went into it and, and the sense of moving forward, they take that all for granted. They put that in the, the you know, the, the uh, uh, it's already um, uh, capital that's been accumulated. They're looking now to what doesn't work. And this is, I think, the really, really big challenge because democracy has to deliver. And for what a number of you have been saying, it isn't delivering. The rising inequality, the sense that wealth is being concentrated, that services are breaking down, 
that health, you know, there have been some major breakthroughs. But when I heard from, from uh, one of the colleagues that, for example, um, the problem of HIV is far from uh, uh, conquered. Quite the opposite. Rates of new infection are increasing again. I take that as one specific example because it means we cannot rest on our laurels. And young people are restless. They don't see, they don't look back. None of us do, but especially, uh, like, for example, my generation. I was born in, believe it or not, the latter part of the, of the war, the Second World War, I hasten to add. Um, but when I hear people talk about the Second World War, for me, well, I don't really remember it. Um, but yet that drives people of a certain age. Partly, I might add, that is what's driven Brexit, nostalgia. But younger people, they're not interested in that. That's why they don't want Brexit, because they say, well, why do we want Brexit? Uh, you know, we don't remember the war, we don't remember all this nostalgia. And I think that's a challenge now for democracy in Africa. Um, one cannot take it for granted. There's a sense that we're going back, it's not delivering um, uh, everywhere, that the, the form is there but not the, the reality, the functions. Um, that elections, we go through the, the routine of elections because that's how we make sure we continue to get money from the World Bank or the IMF or the UN or whatever. But is there a real commitment to those elections? And that's now being reflected in really, I mean, leave aside the, the really difficult cases. But when I saw in Nigeria, and we were there for the last, ele well, the last two rounds of presidential elections, the precipitous drop-off in the turnout rate, and Pascal Holland is here from Switzerland who was there. I mean, it's, it's, there were some other factors, you know, elections were postponed for a week, etc. But nevertheless, when you have, what was it, 30%, 35% turnout, if that? Hmm? 35. In a, of, of registered voters, which means the actual turnout of eligible voters was probably around 25%. So, and that's Africa's largest country. So they really, we have to ask ourselves real serious questions about where is democracy headed in the continent. And then we have the cases where we haven't even got to that point. We've had two delegations here for separate discussions, private discussions from the DRC and from Zimbabwe. Again, that's been very, very instructive. I've sat in on both. And you see the problems that they are confronted with, which frankly go far beyond what the average country is having to experience. And you realize we cannot be complacent. They're still struggling for democracy. And yet in other parts of the continent, we're taking it for granted and not even turning up to vote. So you've got these contrasts. And I think those have come out of this, out of this uh, conference. Um, there isn't one size that fits all. Uh, even within the SADC region, there are different experiences, different expectations, different hopes. And I think that's the question now. How do we move forward? How do we deliver a democracy? How do we produce a democracy that delivers? Uh, and particularly, how do we engage young people who will also feel that this is a worthwhile in investment for them? I think there's two things that count. Awareness and activism. And they go together. And that's what we should be trying to do now through events like this and things that may follow. Supporting those who want to be active, but increasing awareness through education, civil actions, uh, etc. cetera. Um, will an annual conference contribute to that? Well, we're gonna look at that. We've uh, established this partnership. We'll see if we can take it forward with other friends, and I'm looking at my friend from Switzerland there in particular, because we can't let this drop. I think we have to recognize what we've been hearing here growing discontent, growing concern that even in the more advanced countries, democracy is slowing, it's not delivering. And in some, we're even going backwards. We're going backwards. So I think all of these things have come together. Um, but again, uh, we, we shouldn't be depressed. Um, I, am, I always think of uh, Winston Churchill's um, uh, remark about democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. Um, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Let's not be uh, despondent. Let's take this as a, as a clarion call to move forward and to help our brothers and sisters in places like the DRC, like Zimbabwe, to achieve that we so easily take for granted now. So again, many thanks to all of you for a brilliant two days, which personally I found extremely helpful, extremely enlightening, and yes, very rewarding. Thank you all. So before um, Mabel comes up, 
I'd, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the team that has helped to put this together, starting with Mabel Sotole. Big hand to her. <laughs> really, without, uh, without her um, consistency, and uh, I know late nights because sometimes I got some emails at odd hours in the evening <laughs> and the weekends, and her collaboration with uh, Sebastian there from uh, Geneva, all over the place. <laughs> And the, the team, um, uh, the Nelson Mandela School, um, we have people in the background who have been doing a lot of the work and support, giving support to Mabel, Marianne, Wendy, and Maria, uh, and others. Thank you very much for putting this together. Really. Um, I was going to say thank you, <laughs> but I think you've covered almost everyone. Um, I wanted to start by saying a significant thank you um, and just underscoring the importance of relationships and trust and the power of networks. This would not have happened if I had not met Sebastian when I was fresh at university in Zimbabwe. He was the communications delegate at the International Committee of the Red Cross and I was the president of the Model United Nations organization at the University of Zimbabwe at the time. And when I met him in a meeting, a separate meeting, we were organizing a, a conference, a Model United Nations Symposium, and I wanted the position of the ICRC on the responsibility to protect. We ended up talking about other things, and I met with the head of delegation. And they said, what, what year are you again? And I said, no, I'm just a second year student. And they said, okay. A few weeks later, they called me up, Mabel, would you like to come in for an internship? I said, does the ICRC give out internships? Wow, that would be great. I need to take responsibility for my life and get some work experience. So I took the opportunity. They saw something in me before I even saw it in myself. And that struck a relationship over the last 16 years. And we've known each other that long. I wouldn't be where I am without Sebastian. I don't want to get emotional, but I'm telling this story not to make everyone warm and fuzzy, but because in this room, I hope we've all connected with someone you don't know, who may not necessarily speak your language, but that is not a barrier. We have people who are bilingual who can join these conversations. There's power in connecting, there's power in action, there's power in trust, in building bridges. So before you leave, if you haven't connected with someone you don't know and someone you're not interested in because you have some strategic goals, please connect with someone in this room. You never know where it's going to lead. Here we are, the Kofi Annan Foundation and the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance, the elders, the United Nations Democracy Fund, and all of you who represent how many institutions in this room. Africa needs us to look beyond ourselves and to step out of what we are used to, to build these bridges. We can't do it alone. We cannot do it alone. I haven't wanted to say much. I think we have such a wealth of knowledge and experience in this room. I wanted to hear from everyone else. I've been asked to sing many times. I didn't want to sing. I wanted to give the platform to other musicians. When you walked in, Ramon Alexander, is one of the renowned jazz musicians in Cape Town. I don't know if you listened. I was going to ask you if you listened. The music that Ramon Alexander writes traces back to the Khoi and the Sun people who lived here before many of us ever knew about Cape Town, the indigenous music of this city. And that form of inclusion and democracy still lives on. I believe music and the arts are powerful. I'd like to see more artists in these meetings that are not just me. Because yes, I can break into song. <laughs> and I love doing it. <laughs> but beyond myself, there are so many others that we can include. And we're looking forward to continuing this relationship to make that possible. I really want to thank Ashanti Kunene and Leonard Nzega who served as our rapporteurs, they've captured the conversations that we've been having. I want to thank uh, the Botle group, who've provided the interpretation services. 
Thank you so much for the work that you've done in helping us to understand one another. To uh, Vision Media, they made this conference accessible online so that people who aren't in the room could still tune in. We're very grateful. To Wendy and the school here at the Graduate School of Business, thank you so much. Fabian, the Protea Breakwater Hotel, they gave us killer rates for this conference. They came on board, they believed in the vision of this conference, we're very grateful. This meeting has been a culmination of relationships coming together. And that's the power that we have in this room. That's the power that we have in this room. Africa, freedom is coming. Africa, freedom is coming, 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 Africa, freedom is coming. We are the bridge. Thank you so much to all of you. We have a, a cocktail planned now. Please join us for drinks. Yes, drinks. Wines, beers, soft drinks, juice, water, whatever you like. Not hard, hard stuff. That you can get on your own tab. We're responsible. <laughs> um, but please enjoy the evening. Finger food, socialize, meet someone you don't know. Strike up a conversation. Don't go to your hotel room. You're only here at this moment in time. So make it count. Thank you. <laughs>